I will be held accountable. Uh, you know, I've got four years. If I don't have this done in three years, then there's going to be a one-term proposition. Let me be absolutely clear. We don't have to choose between a future of spiraling debt and one where we forfeit our investment in our people and our country. To have both requires not just spending cuts, but increased revenue. The president let everyone know that he was ready to have that tough conversation. We can solve this problem, but that starts by being honest about what's causing our deficit. So here's the truth. My plan will require us to come together and make up the additional savings with more spending cuts and... And... <laughs> President's just going to lay it out there to defend his vision of government's responsibility to this country. President Obama's just going to say it. He's going to be honest. He's going to keep it real. It's going to be a tax increase, people. <laughs> Here's the truth. Our tax bite is at its lowest point since the 1950s. It's not politically popular, but he's about to let us know that we're going to have to raise taxes. Go ahead, sir. My plan will require us to come together and make up the additional savings with more spending cuts and more spending reductions in the tax code. What? <laughs> spending reductions in the tax code. The tax code isn't where we spend, it's where we collect. And that, oh. <laughs> I guess what you said is tax code. Code for raising taxes. You managed to talk about a tax hike as a spending reduction. <laughs> Can we afford that and the royalty checks you're going to have to send to George Orwell? <laughs> That's the weirdest way of, let's say, tax hike. That's like saying, I'm not going on a diet. I'm going to add calories to my excluded food intake. What is your biggest failure? Well, you know, uh, Jorge, as you remind me, uh, my biggest failure so far is we haven't gotten uh, comprehensive immigration reform done. Uh, the credit rating uh, agency Standard & Poor's has decided to downgrade America's credit rating, America's AAA cre credit rating. They've The official unemployment number, 8.3%. That's the longest period of time, 42 months. The longest period of time we've had unemployment above 8% in American history since this has been recorded. This is an extraordinary record of failure. There was not so good news for the campaign of Barack Obama. The debt load of the U.S. government hit $16 trillion. I think the White House has to understand that some of this is coming from its ranks. What we're talking about, reports about the Navy SEAL raid on Osama bin Laden, U.S. missions in Pakistan, the outing of a Yemeni double agent, details of a cyber war against Iran and the U.S. drone program. A startling discovery at an underground bunker in Iran. The U.N. nuclear watchdog finding the highest level of enriched uranium ever. The IAEA can confirm, quote, that Iran has started the production of uranium enriched up to 20 percent. New finding puts it over the level needed for energy production. Iran says it overshot its enrichment target by accident. Now we've seen that they're enriching it to the highest level ever. We found underground nuclear sites that, that we didn't know about before. Uh, which is believed to be buried in the mountains in a military facility near the Iranian holy city of Qom. I mean, uh, my biggest failure so far is we haven't gotten uh, comprehensive immigration reform done. I'm going to read to you what Mr. Uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, has said, and then you can respond if you agree or disagree with him. Israel must be wiped off the right. map, and God willing, with the force of God behind it, we shall soon experience a world without the United States and Zionism. That's what he said on October 28, 2005, according to Al Jazeera. The U.S. now scrapping plans for a missile defense system in the Czech Republic and Poland. When uh, the President uh, Obama, when President Obama came to office, when there was a change of administration in Washington, this plan was changed, was altered, and now Poland is paying the consequences. To put it simply, our new missile defense architecture in Europe will provide stronger, smarter, and swifter defenses of American forces and America's allies. He said that the new approach uh, would be swifter, smarter, and more aggressive in uh, going after threats around the world. Your reaction? Well, I, I wish any portion of that was, was true, actually. 
the plan that he's scrapping um, that would have been a European land-based system uh, would have provided both Europe and the United States with short, medium, intermediate, and long range. And the most important aspect of this would be long range ICBM protection. Uh, it would have been able to respond if uh, Iran, for example, would shoot an ICBM at the east coast of the United States. What do you think of this decision, Senator? Good morning. Hey, Bill, I, I see two serious problems. One is uh, what the world thinks of us, because we didn't keep our, our word. They agreed to do it, they took a risk, and now all of a sudden we pull the rug out from under them. I think that's uh, terrible for our image. Senator, you have an ally in the Washington Post. Uh, this is what they write this morning in an editorial in the paper. In adopting its new course, the Obama administration has clearly bruised some of the staunchest U.S. allies in Europe while encouraging the Kremlin's hardliners. It needs to do more to repair that collateral damage. The other aspect is time. Again, this system having been slated for availability as early as 2013, the White House in their own communication indicates that their plan won't even be available till 2020. So sitting here in 2009, having the President of the United States saying that he is going to choose a different plan that's available 2020 for a threat that I believe is, is absolutely imminent and scrapped a plan that would have been available 2013, it certainly is very curious. The second problem is we will be naked. We don't have no defense from something coming from Iran for five years. So why the change? Why the change in policy? The president had signaled that perhaps he wanted to, to start a relationship with Russia and placing that on the table uh, would be helpful uh, in exchange for Russia uh, coming to the table to assist in uh, Iran's pursuit of its nuclear program. Now, there has been no indication that Russia has any indication of doing that. In fact, the indications have been in the opposite. Having the president concede this before we enter into strategic negotiations of our nuclear weapon systems. The, the trouble with that is, historically, there has never been a point where concessions to the Russians in negotiations has ever resulted in any advancement of concessions on, on their part. So it's an odd strategy to take, um, but I think that's the only one that we're left with. With an ATF program called Fast and Furious. <laughs> Anywho, we lost track of about, uh, is that, uh, hold on, uh, uh, 2,000 guns. <laughs> Congress ultimately asked the Justice Department the details of this somewhat curious program, <laughs> to which the DOJ responded in a February 2011 letter that said, we don't know what you're talking about. So about a month later, CBS breaks the story of the program publicly, at which point the Justice Department withdraws the first letter and sends Congress a new letter saying, <clears throat> Oh, fast and furious. <laughs> Congress has, for the past year or so now, been asking for thousands of documents relating to this. Attorney General uh, Holder has refused to give the documents. Yesterday, the House Oversight Committee voted to hold Holder in contempt. <laughs> if only there was some way to take the temperature of this whole thing up a notch. President Obama has entered the fray and asserted executive privilege over the documents that have been requested by Congressman Issa. Oh, no, you did! Oh, dear! Here's the problem. It turns out that during the Bush administration, executive privilege was seen by the Democrats as a refuge of scoundrels. It upset many, many people back then. Here's one of them chosen at random. There's been a tendency on the part of this administration to to try to hide behind executive privilege. All right, at last count, Fox News has the number of czars in the Obama administration at 33. These special advisors, as the president calls them, help shape policy, but they don't answer to Congress. The other presidents also have had czars. No one could hold a candle now to President Obama. Uh, and the home run hitter here is obviously President Obama. Is it the idea of a czar you object to, or 30, more than 30 of them that you object to? I'll have to admit it's a little of both, because presidents have used the title of czar for kind of special task force type people. But when you start getting 34 czars and you've only been in office eight months or seven months, it, it gets worrisome to me as a member of Congress. Why does a 31-year-old with no automobile background, for example, why is he the automobile czar? Why do you need somebody in charge of Guantanamo Bay and the Sudan when you have a Secretary of Defense? Why do you need the Secretary of Energy if you're going to have an energy czar? And the list goes down the line like that. They're, they seem to be duplicating the existing political infrastructure for the president and the executive branch. So, and yet you, you wonder, well, where does one's job begin and the other one's end? It's our system of checks and balances. It's, it's how our country uh, was designed. We were designed 
the three branches of government. You have the judicial, you have the legislative, and you have the executive branch, right? Then what happens, this, is, this was to protect liberty by ensuring that power could never be concentrated. Both sides of the aisle have slowly been chipping away at this. And they've been doing it lately with something called a czar. Well, you might look at this and say, well, what's the problem? I mean, they can cut through all the bureaucracy. They can get stuff done, right? Oh, yeah. Except remember our founding fathers? They were kind of smart. They had this whole idea, let's balance power a little bit. Usually, this is what the system looks like. The czars, they don't answer to anybody. And the oversight is one of the most important jobs of the legislative branch. What is Barney Frank always saying? Uh, there's got to be some oversight. Why is there no oversight? Why is no one looking? That's their job. I mean, if it was, if it was, you know, oh, this is no big deal, then why do we have a health czar when we have already confirmed a health and human services? We already have that. Why do we need a border czar when we have ICE and a Department of Homeland Security? We already have that. Why do we have these little czars over here that... They answer to no one. Why do we need a car czar when we already have treasury and energy departments? The answer, because this bureaucracy, they answer to everybody, eventually you. These guys, no, they answer directly to the president. Everybody else has to answer to you, the czars don't. And section 2 of Article 2 says that the president must seek the advice and consent of the U.S. Senate for his principal officers. And these are clearly principal officers. These are people who answer directly to the White House, so they get around Congress. And the reason why the Constitution put the safeguard in there is so that we'd have an opportunity to vet people. The California Water Czar, the Special Master on Executive Pay, or Pay Czar, Health Care Disinformation Czar, the God Czar, even the Great Lakes have a czar. And the most important lesson I've learned is that uh, you can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. And can you really not change Washington from the inside? Hey, everybody, remember my campaign slogan? Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> you want us to fix it? Look, if you make a Facebook page, we'll like it. It's the least we can do. But it's also the most we can do. <laughs> That's why we sent you. So in conclusion, Mr. President, what are you doing? For a long time, I sat between the two graves and wept. The pain I felt was my father's pain. My questions were my brother's questions. Their struggle, my birthright. We are all shaped by our pasts, and we carry elements of the past into the future. But we have to be careful, because nothing can rob the future quite as much as the debts of the past.